Good morning, it is Sunday the 10th of May at 10.30am and a very warm welcome to our morning worship here with the Butts Church. Let's start with some words from scripture. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes the grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. What wonderful words there from Psalm 147. For our first reading this morning, it is taken from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. And it's Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 to 12. That's Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 to 12. And Phil is going to read it to us. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple, towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me round the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastwards with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region and goes back down into the Arabah where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglaim there will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Thank you, Phil. In the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, we are told that God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Genesis 1 verses 26 to 27. And one of the ways that we are like God 
is that we are creative. God created the heavens and the earth, all the wonders of the universe, stunning mountain ranges, beautiful coastlines, every animal and creature, and that of course includes us. But we are creative too. Not to the extent that God is, of course, but we can create works of art, bait goods, music, crafts. And so we're going to have a little look at some of the things that we have been getting up to whilst we've been on lockdown. Thank you for all your pictures. It's been wonderful to see what some of us have been getting up to. Ruth is now going to lead us in our time of prayer. Shall we all pray together? Dear Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend hearing your word and sharing together, even though we can't be together at the moment. Um, Lord, we thank you for this VE Day weekend. Lord, we thank you so much that we can celebrate um, the freedom that you gave to us in this country. Lord, we um, thank you for those who fought. We thank you for those who were leading the country at the time. Lord, we thank you for those who took on additional roles um, back at home. And Lord, we thank you for the time that we can remember this weekend. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and preservation of our country. Lord, we thank you for the freedoms um, that you have given us. And Father, we pray that you will continue to look after us as a country. Lord, we thank you for um, the fact that we have seen your hand on us over the past few weeks in this difficult time. And Lord, again, we remember those who are leading the country. Um, Lord, we pray for them, Lord, that you'll give them great skill and great wisdom. And as we hear later on today, what the 
Um, plans are for the next few weeks and months. Lord, we pray that people will be willing to follow the guidelines that are given, um, but Lord, especially that they will be wise and sensible. Lord, we pray especially for our Prime Minister, um, that you'll be with him. Lord, we thank you for your hand of healing that has been on him um, as he suffered from the coronavirus. Lord, we pray too for those in our country who are ill at this time. Lord, for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, for those who are perhaps feeling frustrated and sad. Lord, we just pray that you will be especially close to, to each one at this time. Father, we also think of other things that are going on around the world. Um, Lord, again, we pray for um, places where the coronavirus is really bad. Lord, for those who are suffering and struggling. Um, Lord, for places where they don't have the resources that, that we have here. Um, Lord, that you'll be with them and bless them. Lord, we pray too for those who have been affected by the um, gas leak at the factory in India. Um, Lord, we pray for their families, pray for those in hospital. Lord, we pray for those affected by the flooding across East Africa. Again, Lord, we haven't heard much about it in the news, but Lord, we pray um, for those who have lost homes and again who have lost loved ones, that they may know you with them. Lord, for your people, that they will rise up and, and help those around them. Lord, we pray for the new Prime Minister in Iraq. Um, Lord, that you'll be with him and the government um, as they make decisions. Lord, help them to, to have wisdom, help them um, to make the decisions that are good for the country. And Lord, we pray too for um, things going on in the United States, Lord, as they have their elections later in the year. Lord, we pray for those who are involved um, in all the things to do with that. Lord, that you will ra rise up, raise up people who will follow you, who will be um, godly men and women, who will serve that country well. And Father, closer to home, um, we pray for those in our church family. Lord, we thank you so much for one another. Um, and even though we can't be together, we just pray again for one another. Lord, we think of those who are shielding, for those who um, perhaps feel stuck in and lonely at this time. Lord, we pray that they may know your very real presence with them. Lord, we thank you so much for um, the fact that we can share these services um, in different ways. Um, and Lord, thank you that we can um, meet together on Zoom and um, other ways. But Lord, we just pray that you will continue to be with us. Um, help us to care for one another. Help us to pray for one another. Lord, we just commit all these things to you. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. Our second reading this morning continues our look at some of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And it's taken from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. That's John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. And Danny is going to read it to us. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then a disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred metres. When we landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there, with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, 
Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thank you very much, Danny. It was great earlier to see some of the things that we have been creating whilst we've been in lockdown. And it's clear that we have a lot of skilled people within the church. Perhaps there is something that you feel very skilled at. Now that might be painting or sculpting or baking or sewing or something else entirely. But maybe it's something that you feel that you can do completely independently on your own. Maybe it's something you've been doing for many years and you think you just have that particular thing completely figured out. But sometimes even the most skilled amongst us need help. Perhaps it's like a writer who needs help overcoming writer's block or a crafter who needs to be shown a new technique to be able to make their vision become a reality. In today's passage, we're going to be reminded that if we live or work for Jesus, no matter how good or experienced that we may feel we are, we still need to rely on his instruction, his provision and his collaboration. And we will start in verses 1 to 3 by seeing the disciples fish. The disciples fish. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. We may be a little taken aback at first as we start this morning's passage, knowing that it continues on from the passages we've looked at over the previous weeks. We know that Jesus had appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus, and then to the disciples, and then eventually to Thomas, providing proof of his bodily resurrection. We may remember that when he appeared to the disciples, he made it clear that his continuing mission was that people would preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations. And he had talked about the gift that they were going to be given, the gift of the Holy Spirit sent from the Father who would clothe them with power from on high. But here are the disciples back in Galilee. And it appears that some of them are going back to their pre-Jesus days, taking up their old profession. As Simon Peter says, I'm going out to fish. So what's happening here? Have they decided that they are going to give up on Jesus' Jesus's words and instruction? Are they like a person who tries a career change later in life, but after one full start decides, oh, that's it, they're going to go back to the thing that they know? It has been suggested by some commentators that never has a fishing trip been judged so severely. And we do need to be careful not to make our own conclusions that are not necessarily supported by the text. There is nothing here that really suggested that the disciples have given up on the mission that Jesus instituted when he reminded them that they were witnesses. Although John's Gospel might not specifically mention it, in the other Gospel accounts we know that the risen Lord Jesus wanted the disciples to go to Galilee. So in Mark 14.28, before Jesus had even been arrested, he said, But after I have risen... I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And then just a few chapters later, when the women had gone to the tomb that first Easter morning and they had been told that he wasn't there because he had risen, they were then told, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. 
Mark 16, verse 7. So the disciples have gone to Galilee precisely because they are following Jesus' instructions. And as they've not been told what they should be doing in Galilee while they are waiting for Jesus, wouldn't it be natural for them to spend time doing something that they know? As many people have said, even the disciples must eat. So when Simon suggests he is going to go fishing, it's not surprising that the others decide to follow him. So seven disciples go fishing, something that some of them knew very well and were very skilled at. In fact, up until following Jesus, it was their occupation, and so it should have posed no challenge for them whatsoever. But things don't go exactly as they anticipated. As although they were out all night, a time favoured amongst the fishermen of Galilee, they caught nothing. I wonder how frustrating this must have been for them. If they had just wanted to kill some time, I wonder how long this evening must have seemed without anything to show for their efforts. But however downhearted they might have felt that evening, how their hearts were going to be swelled in the morning, as in verses 4 to 8 we see Jesus instructs and provides. Jesus instructs and provides. Verses 4 to 6. Early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Just as with the couple on the road to Emmaus, at first when Jesus appears, the disciples do not realise that it's him. Now this may have been because, as in that first encounter, Jesus wanted to conceal his identity. But it could also just be that in the early light of the dim morning and Jesus being a hundred metres away from him, they just couldn't make out who he was. But although they might not have been able to see him clearly, they could certainly hear him as he calls out, friends, haven't you any fish? This is a very interesting phrase if we look at it in the original Greek. Firstly, the word translated here as friends could more literally be translated as children, but it could also be translated as lads. Whatever the original intention, it is a friendly and almost familiar greeting. But then we get to the word translated here as fish. This isn't the normal ichthyous word that we might expect to be used when it means fish, but rather prosphagian which is usually used for a relish used with bread that contains small pieces of fish. So as Jesus calls out to them and they answer no, we have this image that they don't even have enough fish to scrape together to cover the top of a small piece of bread, which makes what follows all the more miraculous. Jesus suggests trying to throw their net on the other side of the boat and suddenly they are unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. This now is the normal ichthyous word. It is an amazing haul that only comes as they listen to Jesus' instruction. Surely some of the disciples must have had a real sense of deja vu at this point, as it echoes many of the elements of the story that Luke tells us in chapter 5 of his gospel, chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. Some people have tried to imply that these two accounts are actually describing the same event, but when you look at the details, they are very different. In Luke's story, the nets began to break, but later on this passage, we are specifically told that the nets did not break. And there is no mention here of a second boat being needed to haul in the fish. I think Jesus chose to perform this miracle in such a similar way because of its links to the previous miracle. But we'll come back to that later. 
Anyway, maybe because of these similarities, the disciple who Jesus loved, who was most probably John, realises who the stranger on the shore is. Verses 7 to 8. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred metres. In much the same way as we saw Peter run to the tomb that first Easter morning when he had heard the women's story, we see him now once again eager to hurry and be with the Lord Jesus. As soon as he's heard John say, it is the Lord, and notice that this is an exact uh, repeat of that phrase, just a few words apart, which emphasises the fact that this was most definitely Jesus on the shore, he wraps his outer garment around him and jumps into the water. Again, due to the translation from the original Greek, this can be taken several ways. Firstly, it may actually mean that Peter was naked, which was what several uh, fishermen used to do in those times, fish naked, and so he has to cover himself up before seeing Jesus. Or it could mean that he hitched up his garment just so he could jump into the water much more quickly. Either way, it is clear that seeing Jesus meant everything to Peter. He wanted to get to him quickly, but also to present himself properly before him. I think we have every reason to assume that Peter still felt very bad about the events of Monday Thursday evening when he denied even knowing Jesus and he never again wanted people to view him as reluctant to be associated with Jesus and so as Simon swims for the shore the other disciples follow in the boat following uh, pulling the fish behind them in the previous passages we've looked at we have seen Jesus open people's eyes to the truth of what is said about him in scripture, the truth of his bodily resurrection and also of his continuing mission. And here we see that Jesus still has the power to perform miracles that he did before he died. He once again shows that he still has power and authority over nature and he again shows that he will provide for people's needs, even their physical needs. But it also reminds the disciples of the important truth that Jesus had taught them when he said that he was the vine and they were the branches. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John chapter 15 verse 5. Having been buoyed by seeing the risen Lord Jesus appearing to them and reminding them of the part that they will come to play in his continuing mission of preaching repentance for the forgiveness of sins, it might have been a real possibility that the disciples would start to rely on their skills and thinking how effective they were. We certainly saw signs of this while Jesus was still alive, when they argued amongst themselves who was to be the greatest amongst them, or who would get to sit next to Jesus on his throne. But now Jesus has shown them with a very real illustration that without him they can do nothing. Even something that they were very skilled at, something that had once been their occupation, was useless until Jesus' involvement. We, as the human race, are very good at thinking highly of ourselves, convincing ourselves that everything that good that happens to us is completely of our own making. Perhaps you have accomplished something in lockdown that you feel very, very proud of. Perhaps you have had to pick up a new skill and it is proving to be of great benefit to many people. For example, it's been widely reported that many people are now attending online church services like this, whereas they've never been in a church building for many years. If you have been involved in building up your church's online ministry, and it's now gaining huge numbers of followers and hits, 
It may be very easy to think how wonderful you are and everything that you have managed to accomplish during this time. You might remember the story of the great King Nebuchadnezzar. He had been allowed by God to conquer Jerusalem and take Israel captive. And he once said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Daniel 4 verse 30. In that circumstance, God took steps to remind him that everything he had was really because of what God had allowed him to have. Here the disciples are reminded that they can do nothing apart from what Jesus does for them and gives them. Are there areas in your life this morning where you are forgetting to give the credit and thanks to God? Things that you pride yourself on and think that you have managed to accomplish without taking the time for thanking for all the ways that God has helped you along the way. All the things he has provided you with. Do you need to humble yourself and remind yourself that all things are possible in Christ and not in you? We are continually reminded of Jesus' humility and we see it here in this passage, especially in verses 9 to 14 as we see Jesus serves and invites. Jesus serves and invites. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus the Messiah, God's chosen king, has risen from the grave. He has paid the price of man's sin so that they can gain forgiveness when they ask him into their life. He has conquered death and so offers the true hope of eternal life. He has appeared and proved the truth of his bodily resurrection. And so what mighty and important thing does the saviour of the world do now? He makes breakfast for his friends. Isn't that amazing? The creator of the universe, the son of God made flesh, served in life, in death, and continues to serve in his resurrection. This is true humility. On Sunday evening, some of us were considering humility, and I reminded us of this great quote by C.S. Lewis. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Jesus knows exactly who he is but he was always thinking of others. Even just before he was arrested and taken to what he knew would eventually be his death, we are told, they went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 36. But there is something else to notice here as Jesus serves his friends. Jesus is already making them breakfast. This means that Jesus already had some fish. In much the same way as he had bread and fish to feed the 5,000, he already has food to provide for them. 
but he invites them to contribute. He already has fish, but he says, bring some of the fish you have just caught. It was caught with Jesus' help. He already had fish, but Jesus invites the disciples to play a part. And through his help, what a part they could play. No mere small scraps of fish to make a relish now, but 153 large fish. Some people think there is special relevance to the number 153, and particularly will uh, link it to the first reading that we had this morning. And whilst that passage does talk about the life and many blessings that come from God, blessings that we may indeed see echoed here, it may be that sometimes people take things a little too far with these ideas, needing mathematical formulas to try and explain why the number is significant. Surely we can just appreciate what a large number of fish this is, and Jesus has helped to provide for them. We are told that none of the disciples dare to ask him, who are you? But this probably means something closer to, is it really you? As we are told, they knew it was the Lord. And he shared a meal with them. And what a wonderful memory this must have been for them. Maybe almost as precious as sharing the Last Supper with him at the Passover. We mentioned earlier the similarities between this event and the one recorded in Luke. And we were left wondering, why do such a similar miracle again? It was after the event in Luke that Jesus chose these people to be his followers, saying, Do not be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Luke 5 verses 10 to 11. Now Jesus is soon going to be leaving them to continue this mission, fishing for people by preaching repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. It is a reminder, a reminder of when they were called and what they were called to do. But as they've seen, it is also a reminder that they won't be able to do this in their own strength. They will still need to rely on Jesus in the form of the Holy Spirit that he has already promised to them to be able to carry out this important mission. But he invites them to serve in this way. He will give them exactly what they need and will provide for them. He doesn't need their help, but he has chosen to allow them to help serve in this way. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then he invites you to take part in this important work too. He doesn't need your help, but he chooses to let you help. But it is an invitation which he does expect you to accept. Did you notice that he didn't ask the disciples, would it be possible to have a piece of their fish or some of their fish? It was an instruction. He invited them to take part but it was an invitation that they were expected to accept. Jesus calls each one of us who have given our lives to him as our Lord and Saviour to help him in his continuing mission as we looked at a couple of weeks ago. But in case we think we need to depend on ourselves or that we are capable of fulfilling this work in our own strength, we are reminded that it is only through him that we will succeed. It is not our work it is his work that he graciously allows us to take part in. No matter how hard we try, we will never convert someone to loving Jesus Christ. We can introduce them to him, but it is Jesus that will soften their heart and open their eyes to the truth. We are collaborators, not instigators. He allows us to serve with him in this important work or fishing for people. And as we do that, we need to remember that we still need to rely on his instruction, his provision, and his collaboration. And how we thank God that he continues to provide all these to us in abundance. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, how we thank you for your constant provision for us. 
Thank you that you invite us to collaborate with you in bringing people to salvation. Please help us to not become proud or to over rely on our own abilities, but rather to be humble and depend on you. Please help us to constantly come to you in prayer and realise that all good things come from you rather than ourselves. And now may God make all grace abound to us so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, we may abound in every good work. Amen. Thank you very much for joining with us this morning. I hope to see some of you at our Sunday evening gathering later on. And as normal, all the details of how to log into Zoom for that are on our prayer newsletter.